1941, the Red Army is a million-strong force fighting for the world's first communist state and facing off against an enemy that has penetrated deep into its territory. But what does this massive army look like? Who commands it and who fights for it? Let's find out. Welcome to a World War II in real time special episode. I'm Indy Nidell. The Workers and Peasants Red Army is officially formed by decree of the Council of People's Commissars in January 1918 in the wake of the October 1917 revolution. It is intended to be a completely new standing army, both a break from the old czarist military of Imperial Russia and a much more capable force than the unprofessional paramilitary units of the Red Guards that have sprung up to fight and defend the revolution. At first, the Red Army follows some pretty utopian ideals. In the heady revolutionary days of 1917, soldiers in the collapsing Tsarist army began electing committees to run their units instead of officers. They do so at the encouragement of the Petrograd Soviet, which also tells frontline soldiers not to hand over weapons to officers if asked to do so. But Bolshevik leader Vladimir Lenin soon realizes that the Red Army needs to be a lot more professional if it is to succeed against the gathering counter-revolutionary forces. He appoints fellow revolutionary Leon Trotsky as People's Commissar for Military and Naval Affairs in March 1918. And he immediately goes about molding the Red Army into a more centrally organized force. Trotsky puts an end to the election of commanders by soldiers and disbands the soldiers' committees. He also realizes that the still new army requires experienced experts to help lead it, and he recruits many officers from the old Tsarist army. Throughout the Civil War era, 300,000 Tsarist commanders will help lead the Red Army. Most do so unwillingly, forced to by the threat of arrest as deserters, and so are kept in place by political commissars at the regiment, brigade, and divisional levels. The army and front levels also have revolutionary military councils. But it's not just officers who are obliged to join the Red Army. Lenin had originally imagined it to be a volunteer army, made up of only the most politically conscious peasants and workers in the land. That proves unsustainable, however, as the Russian Civil War grows in scale. In June 1918, Lenin and Trotsky begin a conscription drive. The revolutionary principles of a peasants and workers army are kept to, however, and only such men are conscripted. So that's how the Red Army begins. If you've seen our Between Two War series, you'll know it experiences a range of successes and failures in the Russian Civil War, Polish-Soviet War, the Japanese-Soviet border conflict, and other conflicts. But how does it look when it's facing off against Nazi Germany in 1941? Well, its command structure is still a mess from the Great Purges of 1936 to 1938, which we also covered in Between Two Wars. They have effectively decapitated the army, and the commander corps still hasn't recovered from this. The army as a whole has been growing significantly from around 930,000 in 1936 to 1,565,020 in 1939. This growth would have outstripped the availability of capable commanders to run it anyway, but the purges only make things worse. To meet the demand, training cycles for commanders are cut in half to get them to the field as soon as possible. But even this is pretty tough to pull off. The Great Purge is also extended to instructors, so now even the training schools lack teaching staff. In 1938, the Frunze Military Academy, for example, needs 300 teachers, but can only recruit 106, 61 of whom are under active investigation. The Purge's also seriously compromised the autonomy of the Red Army, which was kind of the whole point of them anyway, and the dual structure of political commissar and commander is still in place. This has some pretty disastrous consequences in the Winter War against Finland. The poor performance of the Red Army prompts Joseph Stalin to replace Klement Voroshilov with Semyon Timoshenko as People's Commissar for Defense in May 1940. Timoshenko sets about reforming the Red Army and reversing some of its politicization. For starters, he introduces a new disciplinary code 
that more sharply emphasizes hierarchical ranks. Hierarchy had been reintroduced by Trotsky, but it is under Timoshenko that full ranks and titles such as Admiral and General re-enter military use. Commanders who have previously distinguished themselves, like uh, Georgi Zhukov and Kirill Meretskov, are appointed full generals. Over a thousand additional commanders are promoted to these new appointments to join the command of the Red Army. Among them, Divisional Commander Mikhail Kerponos, who distinguished himself in Finland. The new structure also carries with it a new disciplinary code, where demands for respect are strictly enforced. Unconditional obedience is ordered, and fraternization between a commander and his men is forbidden. Accompanying all this is a new training program. Red Army soldiers are to learn to fight in any and all conditions and combat scenarios. Historian John Erickson has this to say about the reforms. Timoshenko wanted an army which could fight like the Finns. This strenuous training program obviously put military matters first. As such, it was a very purposeful attempt to redress the balance in the Red Army, which had swung in favor of the political administration. The army was commissar ridden. Voroshilov's picture of the commander and commissar as an integral unit had turned out to be seriously distorted. But while Timoshenko's reforms begin to rebuild the army, it is still disastrously unprepared for war come June 22, 1941, and the military command structure reform is overtaken by events. Stalin's abuse of his consolidated personal power had forestalled army preparations for an invasion. And now, with the enemy within its borders, Stalin responds to the chaos with more consolidation of power. On June 23rd, he sets up the Stavka of the Soviet High Command, consisting of a dozen senior officers, including the Chief of the General Staff, which now reports directly to the Stavka and functions merely as the source of planning and information from which the Stavka makes the final decisions. Confusing? Well, on June 30th, the Sovnarkom, Council of People's Commissars, the highest executive body of the Soviet state, is subordinated to the newly created State Defense Committee, GOKO, composed of Stalin, Molotov, Voroshilov, Malenkov, and Beria. The Stavka too reports to this committee, so military command is pretty convoluted, filtering down from the GOKO through the Stavka and the general staff to the front commanders at the border military districts and finally to the generals in the field. And what about the men they are commanding? Remember that the Soviet Union is vast, stretching from Finland to Japan and containing over a hundred different ethnic communities or nationalities, the vast majority of which have their own languages and traditions. People from all over make up the Red Army. A census taken on January 1st, 1941 shows that 56.39% are Russians, 20.24% Ukrainians, 4.35% Belarusians, 5.32% Central Asian, 1.18 Armenians, 1.09 Azerbaijani, 1.37 Georgians, 1.99 Tartars, and 1.84 Jews. Generally, the ideal candidates for service in the Red Army are educated young men from urban areas, and preferably ethnically Russian, Ukrainian, or Belarusian, as these groups are regarded the most reliable to be entrusted with combat tasks, and less likely to abandon their posts. Having said that, there has been a general trend throughout the 1930s of more minorities being integrated into the Red Army. Notably, there was an increase in soldiers from Kazakhstan, with 18,000 Kazakhs entering the Red Army in 1939, as opposed to 8,000 in 1938. The tremendous military disasters in the summer of 1941 escalate this trend even further. To make up for their gargantuan losses, restrictions that are placed on ethnic groups deemed unreliable are lifted. Though conscripts from Central Asia or the Caucasus region are mostly transferred into non-combat roles behind the front lines, organized into labor battalions, or people's militia units for local operations. Men from Central Asia and the Caucasus who come from rural villages often do not know at all, or know very little, Russian. This language barrier greatly complicates their ability to properly carry out orders. And in an army as big as the Red Army, the treatment of these soldiers and their experiences varies greatly. 
discrimination against minorities by fellow soldiers and their superiors is not unheard of. Such discrimination, of course, affects morale and leads to desertions. As a result, the Soviet government from 1942 will adopt policies which crack down on racism and cultural insensitivity. So, that is a very rough overview of how this army actually looks. It's an army still adapting not only to modern warfare, but also its own political system and national makeup. Right now, it is on the back foot, suffering staggering casualties as Axis forces push deeper into its territory. But it is an army that is learning and adapting, and it appears to have a virtually unending pool of manpower. Men on the front are replaced as they fall, and the question now is whether the armies of Germany and her allies can keep up the offensive. If you'd like to learn specifically about a guy who commanded the Red Army, then check out our bio on Georgi Zhukov. You can click on it right here. And join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com so we can make more extra stuff like this and flesh out the regular episodes ever more. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.